The Secrets of Star Wars is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Wars, episode 29. Hello there. It's a power that Jedi have that lets them control people and make things float. Impressive. Every word in that sense was wrong. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I find your lack of faith disturbing. It's against my programming to impersonate a deity. That's not how the Force works. Force is with me, and I am with the Force, and I fear nothing. Remember, the Force will be with you, always. Hi, I'm Father Andrew Kinsetter, a.k.a. Father Fett, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Wars, where we talk about everything connected to that galaxy far, far away. Today we're discussing Chapter 4 of Star Wars The Mandalorian, titled Sanctuary. Joining me today on the panel are Andrew Hermes. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Father. How's it going? It's going pretty well. Also joining me, we have Thomas Sanjurjo. Hello again, Thomas. Hi, Father. Good to be back. Absolutely. Third, we have Angela Cialana. Welcome back, of course. Hello, y'all. And finally, this evening, we have Mike Creevy. Hey, it's good to be back. It's Yeah, it's good to have all five of us together again. So this evening we are talking about episode four of The Mandalorian. It's titled Sanctuary. Disney's uh, summary is, is simply the Mandalorian teams up with uh, an ex-soldier to protect a village from radar, raiders. Um, so I guess first impressions from you guys. What do you guys think? I really like this one. I This is, this is one of, uh, I, I think that I have figured out the Star Wars formula. So the Star Wars formula <laughs> is uh, watch some old Kurosawa films, uh, read some old uh, anime and figure out how you're going to make a film out of that. Because it, <laughs> I mean, and, and, and honestly, if you go back, if you look at Lucas, that's what Lucas did. Right. So uh, so George Lucas is uh, he's, he said several times that his original uh, inspiration for the original series was uh, this movie called The Hidden Fortress, which is an Akira Kurosawa movie. And uh Obviously, it made a great set of films and a great franchise from there. Uh, and this one is another one that's based on a similar kind of thing where they took the story of the Magnificent Seven or the Seven Samurai, as it was in Kurosawa's uh, movies, and they made it into um, a kind of shortened version with uh, not quite seven heroes. <laughs> For those of us who are not aware of those movies, like myself, uh, <laughs> can you can you just kind of briefly give a an overview of of what the Seven Samurai is and um they, more or less how that relates, of course, to the episode. All right, but but I'm gonna like tell the whole episode here. So here you go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> spoiler it's, uh, alert. It's, yeah, spoiler alert. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you start off with seeing some raiders that are planning an attack on a village, and then the people get wind of this. The people in the village get wind of this, and they figure that they need some way to protect themselves. So they uh, go run off to uh, a nearby uh, town to try and uh, muster up some samurai. So they find these uh, seven ronin, which are samurai that don't have uh, masters. That, that they don't have anybody that's over over them. They hire them for nothing, basically. But these guys are all so broke or uh, wanting for a fight that they are willing to go. And they end up going to the village to help these people out. Through the course of helping the people out, they try and get the people involved in their own defense. And then this huge, uh, surprising uh, uh, thing that the enemies have that they weren't expecting ends up causing a lot of trouble. And they manage to beat it in the end uh, at great cost themselves in some ways. And then uh, they become the heroes of the town. So there you go. <laughs> in, an, in a nutshell, <laughs> really quickly, there it is. <laughs> it's like a far <laughs> less violent version of the, uh, what, like 2006 Rambo movie? Yeah. <laughs> like the, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like kind of the same thing, but much better. <laughs> that's a good story you know it's, it a, it, it, it's it's like a classic um okay it's the this group of people that's down and out they need some help mm-hmm. uh and they find it in an unlikely place with these uh questionable characters that end up redeeming themselves through acts of bravery and um and and attaching to the people of the town and actually it reminds me a little bit this is kind of a stretch but a little bit of the book of judges you know, like in terms of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some, you know, not quite the same, but the idea of like a, you know, God raising up the person you need when you need them, you mm-hmm. know, and then when it's over, it's, you know, they move on kind of thing almost. So it's, it, it is kind of, it's this, 
the whole like Joseph Campbell thing, you know, the hero with a thousand faces. I think there's there's a lot of truth to that, even from our faith perspective. You know, this 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 uh, this seems to resonate with us, you know, across time and culture. And, and you know, it's just really a fun story and something that, that really matters. Yeah. Um, for me, there was like just a little bit of disappointment in watching this episode because I felt like I had seen it already. Um, I have never seen a Kurosawa film, but um, I did see the Clone Wars um, episode that's dedicated to him uh, called Bounty Hunters. And um, it is exactly that plot. Um, and uh, there are bounty hunters who are the Ronin in the in the Hidden Fortress. So, um, yeah, I mean, I also kind of felt like, oh, there was maybe it just felt a little more real world to me than Star Wars in places here and there, especially at the beginning when um, he is in that, I guess, common house or pub or tavern or whatever it is. Um, yeah, it just felt a little bit too um, in our world for me at those moments. But um, there are definitely some some hidden treasures in this episode as well. Cool. Well, we'll get to that here in just a minute. Andrew, what do you think? Yeah, I thought the episode um, was great. Uh, I think they're, the, the show is keeping up its quality. I think this is the most TV type episode. Like, I think it was very, very much like a television episode. Uh, I think the previous episodes may have been more cinematic um, in their scope um, and in their storytelling. Um, this one, I mean, you know, you had a, a lot of montages that had to go by really quickly to, you know, to, to let time go by just, you know, for the sake of the 40 some odd minute, you know, runtime. Um, and, uh, you know, it was basically, you know, your villain of the week type episode. Um, uh, but I, I don't find anything wrong with that. And, and I do agree with Angela. I, I, the only thing critiques I would have of the episode were, I think that bar scene in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, all the interactions like he had with the bartender and, and the way it was set up. Yeah, I would agree. It was maybe a little too real world and star Wars universe, but, um, uh, especially the way they were talking to each other. Um, you know, at one point he said, what the hell? Like, (laughs) (laughs) I don't think I've heard that many times, uh, in a star Wars movie or TV show. Um, do they even know the concept of hell? Uh, they do. It, it, it's it, a good... it appeared in the new movies. Uh, in The Force yeah. Awakens, I believe, uh, Finn, used that, Finn used that phrase. <laughs> oh, and, well, there you go. And Han like... said it. Your Tauntaun will die. You know, I'll see you in hell. <laughs> I'll so, see you in hell. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I whatever would, whatever yeah, that I, means. <laughs> what I was thinking of that, I'm like, if, if anyone has said it before, it's definitely Han. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, but again, yeah, I mean, the obvious, like, I also thought of the, the Bounty Hunters episode from Clone Wars, and it's an obvious, uh, you know, movie trope that from the Kurosawa film, Seven Samurai, like we discussed, but pretty much every movie trope you can date back to a Kurosawa film. So (laughs) we can't really say it's a ripoff. It's absolutely true. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, and, and I, I and, and, and that's okay because I think a lot of people, and especially this generation hasn't seen Kurosawa films. So um, if you're going to recycle anyone, he he's the guy to do it uh, to, to steal from. Um, but overall, uh, and also um, uh, I'm forgetting her name. Is it Dina something? Dina Karana who played uh, uh, Gina, 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 Gina Yeah. Yeah. Gina Carano. So I totally butchered her name, but I thought, um, I've seen her in some stuff. Like, obviously she's only done really like action movies. Um, but I've always thought she was a horrible actress, but I thought she was actually like, she did a pretty good job in this one. Um, Mm -hmm. and she had quite a few lines. Um, so, and I thought she delivered them very well. Um, and I liked her chemistry with, uh, uh, Pedro Pascal. So, Mm -hmm. um, overall I thought it was a great episode. I would just echo more or less what you guys have already said. Um, I don't have the connections that you guys have to the, to the seven samurai or even the clone wars episode. So for me, it was all fairly new and exciting. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Uh, the other random question that I keep having is, is I keep wondering where these characters are going to show up again, because so <laughs> far, like 
uh, and I'm blanking on his name, but the Ugnot like showed up for the first two episodes, and I have oh, no man. idea if we're gonna see him again. Yeah, and I'd like to, um, you know, and I'm assuming that we're gonna see, uh, that we're gonna see Cara Dune again, but how and where and why, don't know. So. Um, yeah, it was kind of a self-contained story, and even the planet I thought was beautiful, but I wonder if we're going to come back to it. Um, some couple things to point out quick before we get into the recap. Um, this episode um, is already episode four, so we're already yeah. halfway through the halfway, season. No. <laughs> yeah, which is which is sad, because uh, I'm, I'm definitely um, enjoying it and, and want it to go more than just eight episodes. The other thing that I thought was interesting, and I don't, I, I wouldn't know how to describe it or or notice anything about it, but the director of this episode was Bryce Dallas Howard, and mm-hmm. her father is Ron Howard, who also directed um, Solo, a Star Wars story. So that was kind of a fun connection. Um, it's the first uh, appearance of of Cara Dune, and it's also the first appearance in a TV, a live TV setting of a Lothcat. <laughs> yeah. Really? So yeah. yeah. Yep. That was exciting. From Rebels, yep. That was And there's well, actually a, a Mandalorian connection a little bit. Uh just slight, but uh Dave Filoni created the character of uh Sabine Wren in uh, Star Wars Rebels and she's a Mandalorian. Um and there's a time in in that series where um a loath cat is kind of like a spirit guide almost for the main character uh Ezra Bridger who can like speak to loath cats like through the force and um and also Sabine Wren. So that that was kind of like a slight tie in with with Rebels. I saw a neat uh, interview too when you mentioned Bryce Dallas Howard it reminded me cuz um her dad, you know, Ron Howard. I mean, nobody has more experience in show business than Ron Howard. You know what I mean? Like Opie from, you know, the Andy yeah. Griffith show and like his whole life. And uh, he was, of course, in um, uh, American Graffiti. You know, Lucas is, uh, you know, big, you know, I guess you could see maybe his breakout movie. Star Wars mm-hmm. really is the breakout. But but it's neat because I saw an interview with when they were talking to the different directors. Uh, I think I, I think you I don't know if one of you guys shared that link or if I shared it with you, but there's so much good stuff. Um where it was just funny hearing her. She's only, I think she's like 38, somewhere in there. So she's growing up, you know, right in the, the that sort of same time period of those original trilogy movies. But because of her dad's connection with uh, George Lucas, she said like, you know, every uh, Christmas, like, you know, she and I guess brothers, sisters, I don't know how many of them there are, like they'd get Star Wars toys from George Lucas, like for Christmas and stuff. I'm like, oh yeah, we all did that. Um, no, but, <laughs> but it was just, it was just really funny because here she is like, she's totally like in that inner circle, you know, but she's a fan, you know, and has been her mm-hmm. whole life. Um, and so like, it was just neat to hear her talk about her you know, opportunity to kind of come in the, you know, and, and direct, which is pretty cool. So I just thought that was neat. I think those tend to be the best directors and the creators are the ones who are fans themselves. And they're not just doing this to, to make money, but they truly love the show and what they're doing. So we'll go ahead and jump into uh, the recap. And uh, so the the first part of the episode kind of lays the scene for us. We have what I thought was a really beautiful scene of the them uh, getting the krill out of the the, mm-hmm. the water and the the blue krill and the the green and and all of it. The the colors were just phenomenal. Um, and we we see these krill farmers uh, getting krill, and they are attacked by a raid of Klaatuinians. And I thought that that was quite an interesting connection. I um, have I just finished reading through uh, the Legends books, The Fate of the Jedi, and the Klaatuinians play quite a role in those stories. So to see the the Klaatuinians in the flesh was was really cool. I know that they've showed up in um, a number of, I think, Star Wars Resistance episodes. They were also, um, the first appearance was actually in Star Wars Return of the Jedi. There was a, a Klaatuinian in the the scene um, above the Sarlacc pit, and and Luke uh, is fighting fighting them all, and I think he actually kills the the Klaatuinian. Um, also, a Boba Fett connection to that too is when Boba Fett is young and he is uh, under Ara Singh and he's working with Bosk. They actually have a Klaatuinian who they work with to try to kill Mace Windu. So that's in the Clone Wars. Mm-hmm. So, 
it just comment on the name of the things here, right? Um, this is just just to show you how much Lucas and pretty much everybody did not know how much these things were going to take off. Uh, this the name of this particular species is from a, a line that is spoken in uh, the day the Earth stood still, uh, where the alien comes down and he says "Klatu Barata Nikto," and so people started asking Lucas, like, "What are these things called? What is this thing called? What is this thing called?" And so he said. I I don't know. Kla- that's a Klaatu. That's so. This is like all stuff that he was just grabbing from anywhere he could to name things, because they just put makeup on stuff and said, "I don't know. It looks alien. We're good." <laughs> and, <laughs> and so you you think now we're what thirty years down the line, forty years down the line, and this stuff sticks. Like this is the you know we're talking about this as a, a, a set of peoples in the Star Wars universe that have appeared in many different stories. And they had this totally throwaway name. <laughs> well, what's even interest, more interesting is I'm pretty sure the name of the character in Return of the Jedi is Barada. And right. <laughs> then to even add more to this, I didn't realize this until I was watching the first episode with some friends of mine with the, with the subtitles on. The, enemy, the mercenary enemies at the encampment where Baby Yoda is, they're all from the species that are called Nikto. And it's that oh, reptile wow. face mm-hmm. kind of character. So, <laughs> yeah, they they've all they all keep kind of showing up in this, which is <laughs> really fascinating. So we have the the raid on the farmers, and so we know that they're obviously in peril. And then we have uh, the Mandalorian and Baby Yoda on their way to this uh, random backwater planet called Sorgan, and have another in, uh, really adorable little scene there between Baby Yoda and the Mandalorian, where he keeps playing with the controls on the on the 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 controls for the ship. And there are a ton of memes about that out there already, and I'm sure you've probably seen them with the different radio <laughs> or the different random songs that he's trying to play, and and Dad the Mandalorian is shutting him down. So mm. those are those are fun. Yes. My my wife my wife's one complaint about it is that he keeps giving him things that he can choke on. <laughs> She's just like, don't get he's a whole choke on that. Stop that. Well, and then he's like, okay, I'm gonna leave. Don't touch anything. Don't go anywhere. It's like, do you so know great. this kid by now? Like, seriously, he's gonna go somewhere and he's, he's gonna touch something. He's, he's, he's better for him to be with you. He's such a new toddler dad. He's like, he's like, got it. Understood. Great. You know, and then he's there. <laughs> He just kind of sighs and says, okay, come along. Uh, and that's actually where he leads him right into that that tavern scene, that common house scene, and um, the loft cat. And, and we have the interaction between the Mandalorian and the, the, the waitress. Um, and he orders bone broth for Baby Yoda. And there was an interesting moment there where he didn't order any food for himself. And, and that kind of plays a role later on because we learn that he never takes off his helmet in public. And so obviously to, to eat and to, to eat soup, he would have to remove his helmet. A friend of mine was, was saying he must just eat smoothies all the time. If he can never take off his helmet. (laughs) That was my question too. So I'm glad they answered that. Yeah. How does he eat? (laughs) Um, But then he sees Cara Dune off in the distance and, and inquires about her and chases her out of the, out of the, the tavern there. And gets into a fight because she thinks he is pursuing her as a bounty. And Baby Yoda just sips on his broth and watches the whole thing. <laughs> I'll tell you, everybody's and another meme was fist. born. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody's fists in Star Wars must be made out of iron because they punched this guy so many times. And I can just tell you, like, punching a person hurts a lot. So I can only imagine what punching a Beskar helmet must feel like. <laughs> um, so they kind of have their little little stalemate thing, and they, they both go back into the tavern and start to, to talk a little bit. And we learn that Kara is an ex-rebel shock trooper. Um, but she's become a, a mercenary. Uh, she became a mercenary and has taken an early retirement on this planet, whatever whatever that ultimately means. Um, and the Mandalorian recognizes that the world is apparently too small for two of them and goes <laughs> back to his ship to take baby Yoda elsewhere. And, and I, I love that. Li- I love that line, by the way, that, you know, oh, planets taken. I'm like the whole planet. <laughs> just sitting there like fly somewhere else, man. Like, come on. <laughs> well, and essentially that's, that's kind of what he, what he does once he's approached by these two, uh, 
these two krill farmers is he he recognizes that there is a way for them to both work together and be on the planet because he's approached by these krill farmers who were uh, attacked in the raid they offer him credits and but i think what what grabs at him more is not the credits because he makes some comment that uh the credits um aren't going to be enough but they mention that they have lodging in the middle of nowhere and mm-hmm. i think that that was what caused him to say okay we can we can make this work mm-hmm. um and so he takes the credits and he recruits kara to come along and help defend the the farmers against the raiders and I think his idea there would be to to protect them, and then if it's in the middle of nowhere, surely they could coexist out there. Um, they go to the village, and we are introduced to well, we were introduced right at the beginning of the episode, but to to Omara. Uh, she's the the mm-hmm. uh, the the lady who uh, shows the Mandalorian where he's staying, and her daughter Winta kind of meet him, and they they talk for for just a little bit, and that's. Uh, where we where we get that scene where uh, Winta wants to feed Baby Yoda and go out and play with him, but that's also where we learn more about uh, the Mandalorian and his helmet, because she asks him about it, and he, that's where he reveals that he can only take it off in private, and he's never been seen publicly without his helmet since he was uh, a kid. I find it really interesting that so many people know about the Mandalorians. Uh, because I mean, you're talking about a very, very backwater planet here, mm-hmm. and, and his reputation just by being a Mandalorian precedes him. They know something of the religious nature of the Mandalorian. So this is, I think, this is. It feels to me the closest thing that we have to like a really massive religious uh, following. Uh, that's different from the Jedi, but just as 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 well known in the mm-hmm. Star Wars universe. Legendary. I guess I was surprised at at how comfortable they were in approaching him, because mm. if if the Mandalorians are kind of known to be, and I and I guess I don't really know what they were known to be, but the Mandalorian is obviously known to be a good bounty hunter and ruthless in his pursuits of bounties, uh, and yet these two krill farmers seem to be fairly comfortable in approaching him with this with this job offer. Well, they did. To me, they seemed a little bit nervous. They kept sort of mm-hmm. stumbling over their words and um, repeating things. So, to me, that uh, signaled a little bit like they weren't comfortable necessarily around him. But um, I, I think that all just kind of showed how desperate they were. Like, mm-hmm. they did approach him, and he is definitely this grand figure, you know. Um, but yeah, I think it shows that they're, they're, desperate it's almost a, like kind of childlike uh, uh, you know I'm, I'm sure there's like so some, there's some more like old testament connections here too the idea of like the you know approaching almost this divine type figure or the supplication some of the language of the psalms too you know what I mean? like it's so bold and it's like you know they don't even understand yet what like what they're dealing with but it's like they they just kind of know he can help you know, mm-hmm. it's like, you know, well, it's these guys are going to kill us. This guy is scary, too, but maybe he'll help, you know, and, and he's pretty awesome. So I, I don't know. It was just it was I really loved that scene of the two of them. Like, you know, it was just a the the pair of them was particularly funny, I thought. And if you want to stretch that analogy even a little bit farther, um, you almost have a uh, the God, so to speak, the Mandalorian lowering himself and becoming part of the community and fighting yeah. for them. And I, I think it's fair to say that he, w- he was willing to risk his very life for the safety of the, the community. So mm-hmm. there's, I, I don't know if you want to stretch it to the incarnational kind of language there, uh, but there, there's a, there's a sense that he is out of their league and yet lowers himself t- and helps them builds them up and trains them. And he and Kara kind of play that role and, uh, he becomes one of them, but at the same time, he didn't become one of them. He recognized that too. So, well, since we're kind of on that topic, um, I don't know if you guys picked up on Moses vibes when we were meeting Omera at the beginning with the basket in the water, um, <laughs> because ah. she they really kind of focus on this woman as yeah. something special. And she seems particularly strong. We learn that she's a widow. 
Um, she can fight. She can shoot at least. And when they are fighting, she seems to be kind of more of a leadership figure, like to kind of help free her people. So I sort of got Moses vibes from from her character. Well, with the Mandalorian too, the the whole like I just I'm I'm really loving this whole like you can't see his face. You know, <laughs> like we keep bringing that up. And when he's standing there, I just kept thinking like in the whole that scene where they're kind of talking to the um um the, to the whole village and uh you know that that whole idea of like you know we can um you know we can fight or you know the, the, like basically they can fight if we show them how that that kind of idea and it's it's funny because it's like he could just take baby yoda and just get on the razor crest and leave you know mm-hmm. i mean he's he's got that mission so it's i, I do keep wondering like well, there's something deeper here with this just like what like what does he owe them you know like there's there's this neat transformation going on where he there is more to him than meets the eye for sure well, that's, I think that comes back to the, like, what is the Mandalorian religion and what are the stories that these people have heard? And, and mm-hmm. I really do think that it's the, there's almost this sense of a, a, a step in and, and be the hero. Like, that's what the Mandalorian way is, is to, to take up the cause that's not, that no one else is taking up. And yeah, they accept money because they have to feed themselves, right? That's like, that's mm-hmm. part of what they're known for because they, they have, that has to be part of what they do. But at the same time, um, you know, he he wasn't moved by the amount of money they were offering. He was moved by their need, and then also the opportunity to help someone else out. Like all of the 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 whole situation of him being in this village is him helping other people, right? And, and he, and, go ahead. I, and that, and that's I think that's like that's part of his way. That's part of what he's been raised to do as a foundling, but then also as part of the the religion itself. Right, because he's the one who says, well, we can teach them. And he's the one who seemed to be um, like, you know, he he took the job, obviously, you know, I, I don't think it was just because they were out in the middle of nowhere, but I think there was something, I don't know, maybe you guys can, can verbalize it, but there was like some intangible thing in the way that Pedro Pascal acted it out that... Um, I got this sense that he really wanted to help them, um, that there was some something deeper, yeah, inside of him. Um, but yeah, he he he's the one who says, "Well, we can teach them how to fight." So um, it seems like there there must be something in the Mandalorian way about maybe um, just that sort of handing on of uh, those skills. You know, it, it seems like. Definitely, they're they're into this foundling concept of, you know, um, handing that on at least. Um, so maybe that kind of carries into this situation too. Well, and he obviously uh, wants to to help those who can't help themselves. He he's right. really wanting to protect the innocent, and and I, and I think that that speaks back to his own his own uh, childhood. His parents were killed. He was he mentions in this episode that he was raised. Uh, taken in by the Mandalorians, and so he knows what it's like to be in that position of being helpless and and needing someone to to guide him. And he you, he uses that that same kind of thing when he relates to to Baby Yoda, and and very true. He he probably recognizes that in this village of of farmers who are innocent and unable to to defend themselves and and wants to help and and recognizes that and yeah i i was watching that that video that i think angela you you sent us um father roderick talking about uh the five things about sin that we learn from the episode of the sin so episode three but one of the one of the points that father roderick makes is that we are changed by relationships and so Mm -hmm. he talks about how the mandalorian is changed by his relationship with baby yoda And, and i think that that relationship is very much the the key throughout all of these episodes is like how is the mandalorian changing because of his relationship to to baby yoda and would he have jumped at the chance to protect this village if he hadn't already rescued baby yoda yeah that's a good question so i i tend to think that baby yoda is changing him in this way that he recognizes the importance of people and you know the the greater aspect of life in general 
I did, by the way. I really love that just that brief little thing when they start to address, like the build up to addressing the, the, the village. <laughs> and he just leads off with bad news. Can't live here anymore. <laughs> Can't live here anymore. And she's just like, you know, bad bedside manner. He's like, okay. <laughs> so he's definitely he's definitely rough around the edges. <laughs> well, he doesn't talk a whole lot. So, you know, no. he hasn't really practiced. Uh, but you make a good point because they, they, they found him. He and Kara scouted out the, the Klaatuinian camp or they started to and they, they saw the, the ATST f- uh, footprint. And that was when they go back to the village and say, sorry, you guys are out of luck. You got to you got to leave. And that's when they, the villagers, come back and say, well, we don't want to leave. We want to we want to fight. Um, and that's, yeah, where we hear that interesting little tidbit about um, Omara that she knows how to shoot. Mm-hmm. Which really begs the question, what? What is her story? And they all seem surprised. Like her own daughter seems surprised. Like yeah. she didn't want to raise her hand. But yeah, that's a cool. We have to find out. <laughs> uh, this is it's, it's a backwater planet. That's where people go to hide. Yep. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah, I think it, what was interesting is like the fact that they found an ATST f- footprint there, and um, you know the questionable past of uh, you know this woman, uh, you know. I'm just speculating maybe she had, you know, there's some reason why she's on this planet, just like there's a reason why the Mandalorian chose to go there. It's some far off, you know, distant planet that, you know, you would think no one could, you know, where no trouble could find you. But as we see in the episode, it's that's not the case. But I mean, the fact that there's an ATST there, it shows you the state of the Empire. So it's mm-hmm. it's kind of like, well, there, well, there's just like parts laying around you know, remnants of the empire laying around that, you know, these, these little tribes or whoever can get their hands on these things, you know, can use to their advantage. Um, and, uh, you know, so even though the empire is, is fallen at, at, at this point, um, you know, their, their weapons are still out there and the consequences of, you know, those, uh, those sorts of, uh, tools, if they're in the wrong hands could be, use at their disposal for um you know very very bad reasons um so i think i think it's uh the episode also shines shines a light on on you know what kind of world we're dealing with right now uh post uh post empire well and two things about that one i love that all of the weapons in these sh- in this show have a different sound so I don't know if you guys have noticed, but like every single weapon has a different sound. So as soon as that uh, blaster came out of the because because the ATSC shoots in the opening scene with the opening raid. Uh, and as soon as I heard that, I'm like, wow, that's a big that's a big gun that's coming out of the forest there. And you kind of get the sense that there's something large. So I, I knew that's probably where they were going to go with it. But uh, then th- so that's that's really interesting to me. And then we're cycling back to the Kurosawa thing. That was the in the end of the um, the Seven Samurai. Uh, the whole thing's about swords, it's about archery, it's about samurai. And the the weapon that comes in with the bandits is a gun. And it was the gun being in the wrong hands and this dishonorable kind of use of a weapon to just kill uh, was the the whole marker of, um, you know, these, these are the bad guys and the, the good guys, no matter how uh, you know, rough around the edges or Ronin they are, they're all honorable because they choose to face their enemies in an honorable way. Uh, I like that that's kind of the theme that came out of this uh, this show too. Um, another interesting little point of of at least that that particular scene uh, when they're teaching the, the village, uh, villagers how to shoot is they keep focusing also on the relationship between the Mandalorian and Omara. And... Mm-hmm. Of course, uh, most of it is nonverbal, but it was it was comical to me to see him watch her shoot the the rifle because you could tell that he was just absolutely captivated by her and, you know, is probably staring just a little bit too long, you know, before he goes back to, to training some of the others. Um, and that relationship, of course, ends up being just kind of key throughout the whole episode. Oh, I was just gonna, even from the get go, when they first have that inter- uh, interaction in the yep. in the hut. And like you said before, Father, too, like she's like they're to some degree comfortable speaking to him. Um, and that whole like you could see he's he's kind of nervous. He's sort of off putting like the you know window runs up and he freaks out and goes for his you know, gun at first. So he, he has that kind of you know cowboy edge, you know, but, you know, she's not 
so afraid of him that she runs off and she's there asking if she can feed baby Yoda, if she can play with him. And, you know, he's, he's, he lets that happen, you know? Um, and then I just laugh though, because for whatever reason, I was so taken aback. Maybe you guys weren't. I was when she says, when's the last time you took that thing off? And he says yesterday, like, I just, I hadn't thought of it. I was like, <laughs> yeah. oh yeah, yeah, right, right. You know, like, oh, yeah, okay. So he does Obviously it a lot. He has to take it off. Yeah. Right, but not in front of anyone. She gets it, you know, like in front of anyone else, you know, and he points at the kids. And that was just such a really cool, you know, this coming back to this mask. And even Pedro Pascal said in an interview, it was funny because they asked him, they said, are you ever going to take the mask off? And like, people are laughing in the crowd and he just kind of smiles and like, looks like, you know, he's not giving anything away. And he's like, it was brilliant though. He holds up his microphone. And he goes, do any of us ever really take our mask off? You know, <laughs> so, but it is, I mean, that's actually a big part of the show, of course, but you know, he was really just, just kind of teasing that one out there. I thought that was pretty mm -hmm. funny. So we'll see. But it's cool because in that same exact scene, he does take yeah. off his helmet. Right. Yeah. We, just, we just can't see yeah. it. We, we just don't see his yeah. face. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, right. and the music was really like compelling right at that moment. Like it kind of focused in on little baby Yoda, you know, and the idea of like, it's just, Somehow it's like there's this this still this distance between the two of them, mm -hmm. but it's like a little le like it's you know it's a little less far than maybe with anyone else. There's there's something this extra intimacy between them. It's just so cool. Yeah, another thing that I thought was interesting um, was the fact that he said that if he were to take his mask off and people saw him, he would not be able to put it on ever again. Uh, so I thought like. You know, that's something I didn't know about the Mandalorians. That's the first, you know, thing, uh, the first time I've ever heard, of, you know, that rule or whatever you want to call it brought up. So uh, I don't know if it's something that's just specific to his tribe, if he's even part of a tribe. I mean, this so far, it still seems like maybe he's part of just this offshoot group of, you know, Mandalorians yeah. um, uh, that are just scattered. Um, or is it, is that is that like religion for all Mandalorians? Mm -hmm. um, and why is that? So. I thought, I thought it was, I thought it was interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't think it's, yeah, I don't think it's. Uh, Cause yeah. Um, in the past we've seen Mandalorians take oh, yeah. on and off mm -hmm. their helmets right. in, like in the, the animated time. series. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I think my guess is that this is a band of Mandalorians that are trying to survive. You know, the armor talks about, their survival uh, is like really essential to them and uh, that they have probably just established this rule to uh, to support that survival um, so that, you know, the anonymity is probably really important for them at this point. It might also be a rule for him specifically as a foundling that he uh, mm -hmm. he can't be separated from it. Although the, the sect that he's part of, they all seem to wear their masks all the time. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of a thing for them possibly, but I, uh, you know, and, or it, I, I was thinking about this too. Like it could be just something that that's, that's a discipline that he's taken on himself. Like he knows that, that that's something that if he takes the mask off that he's done, mm -hmm. that he's decided to do this. He's committed to it fully. And he knows that as soon as he does take the mask off, um, that means that he's so closely connected to someone that he can't, in good conscience, go back to the life that he's leading now. It's almost mm -hmm. like penitential. It's like his hair shirt or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's right. so cool. Like it's yeah. kind of like yeah. a wedding ring to or, me. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Priest, wow. priest's collar. <laughs> right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> well, and they they definitely try to tease that out a little bit too. I know we're to jump ahead just a little bit, but that what he and Omarin have that have that conversation and she she starts to take off his his helmet. And you can tell that that he he wants to say yes to her and he wants to mm -hmm. stay and he recognizes that that would be a beautiful life. But I also noticed in that moment she she points out that baby Yoda is obviously happy and she asks him if he's happy mm -hmm. and he doesn't answer the question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he ends up saying more or less he baby Yoda belongs here, but I don't belong here. And so he keeps the helmet on and, and isn't quite willing to make that, make that uh, commitment to let go of his, his Mandalorian uh, culture and background. Yeah. It's uh, if this show really wanted to establish itself as a Western, I think it really did with this episode. I mean, yeah, I mean, from, from other than all the obvious, like uh, things that we talked about, it, the influence from Curacao and Magnificent Seven, um, to the music, but you know, you have this, this woman who's 
you know, not a damsel in distress, but a very able and, and, and like very, um, you know, core piece of the, the battle. Um, you know, she's the best shooter out of all the villagers. Uh, it's, it's, it's something you've seen in a lot of Westerns where there's, there's a woman that's willing to fight and she's the one that usually falls in love with the lead. And then at the end, she begs him to stay and he can't, he has to go back on the trail. So, um, yeah, if if John Favreau was aiming to create a space western, I think there's no <laughs> argument anymore. And that's you know some of those themes in um oh I'm I'm just forgetting the name of the movie now uh oh uh Open Range. Did you guys ever see that with mm. uh, Kevin Costner yeah. and Kevin and, Costner? Um, yeah. Oh, Robert Duvall. And he now he you know spoiler alert he doesn't quite go off to the distance in the end, but there's like they really have that on the edge there, and like it, it really kind of matches that um. So a lot of that same feel, like these guys who, you know, um, in his case, that has like a dark past. We don't really know a lot about it. You know, he was sort of a a shock trooper type guy himself. And now he's trying to just, you know, stay away from all of it. Uh, I think he says at one point in that movie, you know, like I put some old things behind me, but they don't want to stay put. <laughs> you know, right. so this this mm-hmm. idea um, and fun fact, Diego Luna, I think, is in that movie okay. um, who he was only like in his teens, I think, at the yeah. time. But uh Another Star Wars connection. <laughs> there you go. He has his own show, doesn't he? Coming out too, they're going to do. <laughs> yeah. <I think>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's we'll right. See. Yeah. Anyway. But yeah, those themes are pretty, pretty sweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So to get back to the, to the, to the recap here, we uh, see uh, Kara and the Mandalorian uh, go to the Klaatuanian camp and strike and provoke them because they've already trained the the villagers and they've set up barricades to to trap the ATSD. They're going to they did they dug a, a hole in in the pond that they want to lure the ATSD to to step into and fall down and and be destroyed by them uh, because the legs are are impenetrable by all the the weapon weapons on the planet. Um, and so they go to the the Klaatu Indian camp they provoke them the fight begins and something that i thought was was quite eerie and ominous and uh was was really well done was the fact that it was at at night and the ATSD steps forward and has these red eyes um i don't know if i've Which, ever seen that before in no and my kids ask my kids are like oh why does it have the red eyes and i can answer that question <laughs> it's because <laughs> if you were inside of this tank like object at night and you did not want to mess with your night vision you would have red lights and yep. so mm. that's that's exactly the reason they do it it's an air force thing that they do that's pretty cool it's a yeah. lower wavelength and it doesn't hurt your mm. eyes as, as much as a brighter light would but it was super interesting of course because it's completely practical but it implies evil you have right. this mm-hmm. it's totally like terminator like yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> And like the way the way that the, when we first see the ATSD, the the way that was shot, um, it reminded me of of Jurassic Park and how you know when like a T Rex coming out, mm-hmm. you know, and it, it's Bryce like we said, Bryce Dallas Howard directed this, and she's in mm-hmm. the Jurassic World, um, so mm-hmm. maybe she took inspiration from that. That's <laughs> that that totally seemed like a scene out of that movie. I was much more terrified of this ATSD than I ever was in like the ones from yeah. Return of the Jedi. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Where the Ewoks, Where the Ewoks yeah. just smash them. It's like, yeah. oh yeah, that's okay. Those are jokes. Sure. Why would you even worry about those things? <laughs> I think Dan, I think Dom said something about that, you know, in one of the message threads or something about like when Cara Dune says, you know, I've seen that I've seen one of those things take out whole companies of soldiers. Dom I think Dom said something like, Yeah, and I've seen a bunch of teddy bears take out like five so, yeah, of them. One of the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but you can tell these are these are you know these are people that don't know how to really operate this thing because <laughs> they could they probably could have easily won that that battle if, if had they known how to really operate it because just from that one blast, you know, it totally missed, but it totally destroyed like one of their houses. Mm-hmm. And you know, I I feel like if if they even knew like half of its capability, it, it wouldn't have been a fight. Well, the thing's got like it's got grenade launchers on it and it's got, you know, all sorts of other gear that like it's got a, a more rapid fire uh, a blaster off the side, too. So it, it's capable of a lot more than they were putting it through. But at least they knew not to step in the water with it. Right. <laughs> it was just stand <laughs> there on the edge, <laughs> ominously. <laughs> what is that? that? Again, that motif of like, you know. You know, like villagers or, or, or um, you know, I don't know, like, you know, terrorists or, or criminal organizations getting a hold of like post 
Nazi or post Soviet, you know, tanks mm-hmm. and equipment, but like they're not maybe fully trained on it, <laughs> you know. So it, it is it is a cool kind of idea to think about that. Well, if you've ever gotten into a, um, I'm remembering uh, <laughs> me and my family went to the Mall of America one time when I was a kid, and we got into one of those flight simulators. And so, like, to just get into that thing and not have a clue what I was doing, but it was, you know, still fun anyway. Um, you know, it's it's that whole idea that that this thing is capable of so much more than I'm actually doing. But, you know, given my all. But we obviously see that their uh, their inept, uh, their, their ineptitude uh, causes them to to fail in this attack. Uh, Kara manages to convince the the ATSD to keep stepping just closer and closer and closer to that pond. Ultimately, uh the ATSD steps in, falls in, and the Mandalorian rushes forward with a, a thermal detonator of some kind and destroys the ATSD. And all the Klatuinians retreat and the villagers win the battle. And so it was, I think, Andrew, you pointed this out earlier, is this this is the the episode with the most time jumps. And I thought it was interesting yeah. that that the aftermath of the of the battle takes place weeks later because there's a mm-hmm. there's a random comment to we've been here for weeks or something. And so the Mandalorian and Kara have been living there for for weeks after the battle without any sort of uh, ill uh, ill things happen. And and that's where we get that whole conversation about what happens if the Mandalorian takes off his helmet uh, between him and uh, Kara. And that's where we have the, the devastating sort of realization that the Mandalorian plans to leave Baby Yoda and uh, go off on his own. Which I wasn't expecting at all, to be honest. I... Mm. I he, he he wants to protect Baby Yoda, and I guess this is that was his uh, way of his rationalization that this is the best way to protect Baby Yoda. Um, but I but I guess from my perspective, and maybe from ours, like we we know that that's actually not what is probably best for both characters. And of course, we yeah, I didn't buy I didn't buy it for a second. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, something's gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, we see, of course, that, that that's not how it plays out, that, that there's a, a bounty hunter who has found the planet and um, is using the tracking fob to track down Baby Yoda. And I am still curious as ever about how those tracking fobs work. Like, how are right? they? Yeah, because it seems like really old tech. And <laughs> I feel like if there was some sort of tracking device on Baby Yoda, you know, he would have found it by now. So, uh, yeah, I'm very, very curious to know as to how that thing works and and uh how they're able to track him so far biometric signals that's that's what i was like <laughs> my kids and i had a long discussion about this we're like okay how does he tra- what is what is what are they tracking and it's like well if they if they could have gotten a tracking device on him then they could have gotten a sample of his dna maybe these things are like i don't know they attach the dna but then the range on these things is mm-hmm. incredible like yeah. how yeah. how yeah so <laughs> i hate to say it guys it might be tracking his midichlorians there you go we haven't said it yet but no oh. <laughs> but that By wouldn't way, apply to know. all the other bounties out there no, that these no, things no. work for i i was wondering though like when we said before about relationships this might be kind of overplanned a little bit but i just like that conversation like just as the bounty hunters starting to show up and it's it's you know very uh, peaceful the music by the way i really loved in this episode like that real kind of sort of somber acoustic rendition of the same themes but much more it's very homestead it's very <laughs> like prairie type music of course um but even like like Yo- little baby yoda's relationship with the other kids mm-hmm. you know and he does the whole frog trick and they all get grossed <laughs> out but he he looks like genuinely like concerned and like he doesn't want to like freak them out like he spits it out it just seemed like cute to me for some reason like you know, he's trying to like you know not gross them out or like they're his friends and he doesn't want to do anything that would separate him from them i don't know just that really seemed to be there for me at least watching that part it was it was really Mm -hmm. cute yeah well and even when winter has has to say goodbye Mm. you can tell that (laughs) that in just the short weeks that they've been there she has made a connection with with Mm, baby yoda and doesn't want to leave well i love how they refer to it as his son right they're like you and your son could stay here and it's like "Hmm." huh 
Like, I know he hasn't taken off his helmet, but we're all pretty sure that this is not what's going on here. Right? I think everybody knows that. So, do but, they say son or do they say your boy? Your boy, I, I guess. Supposed, I, yeah, I, yeah. The, the, or yeah. Um, I, now, now I'm uh, gonna have to go back. Now and I'm find wondering out. if oh, they no, ever say son. <laughs> <laughs> but there's you still there's still a, a a definite connection that that they recognize that the man Mandalorian is raising Baby Yoda as his. Yeah adopted son yeah and uh, i read something that pointed out that this is one of the few times that you see children in star wars like you don't yeah. see children often mm -hmm. at all in the star wars series it's all it's all a very adult like all of the characters are adults they're when I mean, they go into a bar it's a, a, a you know it's a bar so they're they're adults mm -hmm. there and um the the few places that you have seen him have either been tragic or uh, for the effect of looking at how horrible this group is because they're enslaving kids or whatever. And so this is one of the, the, the only places that we've really seen happy kids in Star Wars. That's interesting. Well, and, and Baby Yoda, again, fits that, that sort of lens to view not mm -hmm. only the Mandalorian, but the, the world around him. Um, well, that's pretty much the end of the episode because once, once they all have to say goodbye, Carr, of course, takes out the the bounty hunter and and the mandalorian recognizes that he can't in good conscience leave baby yoda behind and so he decides to take him and uh and leave and um again i i mentioned this at the beginning of the show but i i really want to know and i and we'll get to it i'm sure but how kara comes back into the story cuz i'm i'm sure this is not her uh, her final scene in in the mandalorian but it seemed to imply that she was planning on staying behind at the village and the Mandalorian and baby Yoda are heading out to find a new hiding spot or wherever they're going next. And I think to the, um, I, I, my fear was, I didn't, I don't know that I really like, it's, it's hard to try to like remember accurately, but I, I was getting nervous in the build up to like zooming in like the sniper zooming in on baby Yoda. Um I didn't really think they'd do that. But I I I don't know. I think what I kept coming back to is it's just there's way too much we still need to know. Like it's more for us maybe than the characters even in the show. It's like mm -hmm. it's like we know that this fits into a much bigger story. You know, we've heard that there's, you know, supposedly connections to episode 9, you know, the whole saga. So it's like we, oh, I need answers. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting here, it's like, yeah. so I, you know, he can't just stay on this planet. I need to find out what's going on with Dr. Pershing. You know, like I, I, I'm just sitting there like going nuts. Like, no, no, he has to go. Well, and so you could, you could remove the baby Yoda character and this could become a revenge story. Just right. As easily and I did, this, I didn't with, think they'd do it, but I was getting nervous. <laughs> yeah. And, that, and that's the, that's the kind of scary yeah. part about it because, because of the way, and I think that was really, it was a brave move and a good move to include such an interesting character in the beginning with the, uh, uh, with the Ugnaught, uh, that mm. we, he was interesting. He was really cool. We, we wanted to see more of him, but we're not, that's right. <laughs> that's where he is. He, that's where he fit in the story. And so to have this character that kind of enters the Mandalorian story and then exits the Mandalorian story just as quickly, um, but makes such an impact. It, 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 it means that, the stakes are there that that Yoda, the, the baby Yoda character could be out and mm. we would still have the story of the Mandalorian to follow mm. because it would change, but it would still be his story. Mm -hmm. That's a very fascinating point, because before the first episode streamed, nobody right. expected a baby Yoda to <laughs> just be Yoda. so <laughs> crucial. <laughs> yep. And yet now, now we can't imagine the show without it. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if anything happens to baby Yoda, oh. <laughs> it's just like having a kid. Oh my gosh! Yeah, <laughs> John Favreau has to know that at least as much as all of us do. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Well, that's why they've all been so so. Uh, they've done God. such a good job of keeping this under wraps. Like it's been. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Everybody who's known has been, done such a good job of keeping this under wraps. Uh, any other final thoughts on the episode before we wrap up? I had just a bunch of little things um, that I looked up about the episode. Uh, so since this is like secrets of Star Wars, it was like, what are these random words that they're using at the beginning? <laughs> like Gringer and per Poringer and Flagon. So Gringer is actually a bird in a children's book, totally unrelated to Star Wars. But I guess they just decided to use it. She says like, oh, I took down a Gringer this morning. So we've got lots of broth. 
Porringer and flagon are real words. So a porringer is a bowl and a flagon is a something you can use to put liquid in. Apparently you can use it during the mass. <laughs> often often a flagon is what's used to uh to bring the wine from um in, during the collection to bring that up to the priest. So, yeah, often that's the word for it. Cool. Um spotchka, so that's a made up word, but it comes from a Russian word that means uh stumble. So I thought that was kind of funny um, <laughs> that they would name an alcoholic beverage that. Uh, at least we that assume it's alcoholic. Awesome. Yeah, it, that stuff looked so cool when the the, <laughs> uh, the Raiders were drinking. Is that glowing blue? I want some spotchka, man. That, that looks amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so those vats that were in the the Raiders tent thing were those spotchka vats? Like yeah, they were spotchka. They were brewing okay. the krill. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. wondering what that was. Um, and then, and it's those, those shrimp too, in the beginning. Yeah. They they were yeah. like translucent yeah. and glowing blue. Yep. Yeah. 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 And yeah apparently they, they make somewhere. good beer. I, I want some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wikipedia said they're made from that, or that's the, the krill things, I guess, or whatever. Somehow. Yeah. So that's cool. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and then a couple things we didn't mention were, um, they finally named the rifle. They called it a pulse rifle. Mm. <laughs> um, so apparently it has something to do with the ion pulses, that's how I can um, disintegrate people. And it's highly uh, illegal. <laughs> Exceptionally illegal, which is, I, I mean, really, they didn't even need to set up a defense system. Just have the uh, have the Mandalorian sit there with that thing and shoot a few of the raiders as they come in. And they're going to lay off, you know. I'm not, I'm not coming back after that. Yeah, and my last note was just that um, in this episode, we learned that the Mando's mask can have like infrared vision because that's how mm. he could track the the footprints. So well, I don't I was think we've ever seen that before. Kind of wondering yeah. how that worked because it was more like I wasn't sure if it's infrared. Would you actually leave heat residue in footprints, or was it more? I thought I took it to be like he could sense recent disturbances mm. because he also looks up like, into the tree and sees that the tree has been kind of knocked around too, but. It looks like infrared, definitely, when they kind of show that mm. that scene. But it's definitely cool stuff to, cool tra stuff tra to learn. Tracking computer, tracking computer. Turn on your tracking computer, and then it, <laughs> it goes, oh, here's some important <laughs> stuff. <laughs> for, all, for all you D&D nerds, it's plus five to tracking for that. That's how, that's how it works. <laughs> the, only, the only thing I had was just really simple. I don't, it was just a quick little shot. I don't know why it affected me so much. Um, I was just, well, maybe I was, I was just doing a uh, recent podcast on... Um, stargazing and just the whole why I think that's important, but that's a whole other thing. But then I noticed maybe just cause I just done that when they get on that little, um, um, whatever you call it, like the hovering bed, you know, they're following the farmers out and you know, being sort of towed out to the, mm -hmm. uh, the farm and just that little shot, like little, little baby Yoda laying on there and looking up at the stars for like mm -hmm. two seconds. And, um, and then it just cuts right to the daytime. But for some reason it just, it was just a really kind of neat moment, I thought, and it was a little reminiscent of that last shot at the end of The Last Jedi with the kid, you know, the, the little farm kid, you know, and just just in one quick shot, maybe so much of, of Star Wars kind of, you know, summed up in one little thing, like that idea of like looking up, imagining, you know, I don't know, hope, possibility, just the big expanse of, of the universe, all this kind of cool stuff. I just thought that was a neat little thing to put in there. Yeah, I think... um just a comment on the show going forward. Um, I'm just hoping that, uh, you know, now that we're halfway through the season that, you know, we, we start getting into more of the story and the bigger picture who's really behind this. And, you know, uh, and, and with this eight episode, you know, uh, for a season, I think, you know, the, they really can't waste any more time. Like, not, I wouldn't call this episode a filler episode, but, um, like I mentioned earlier, it was just very reminiscent of like, you know, your villain of the week type episode of a, you know, of a season, um, just to kind of transition you, you know, to the, to maybe the climax of the show that, that we're approaching. Um, so hopefully I would hope that the next episode, you know, kind of veers more to that territory. Yeah. I, mean, I think we get the moment where it's like, okay, let's take a breather but we can't do this permanently. Like we can't be done. There's no, there's no way that, that you can just stop and, and finish here. And um, yeah. And I, I think 
I, I like that we're having these characters that are touching his life and leaving, but making an impression on him. Uh, and, I, and I think it's so good to have characters that have a backstory that, we're, that we don't need, but that we're interested in. Uh, so like Omera's character is the, the, the best example of that, where it's like, why is she a good shot but living in this little uh, fishing village in the middle of nowhere? Uh, because we can fill in those blanks ourselves, And that's what so much of that, that's why the Star Wars franchise exists the way it does, because there were so many of those tiny little things in the original series that were just thrown in because they, they wanted to fill the world. Mm. And and now it's expanded into this huge thing. And we forget sometimes that it's it's OK to have those questions like we don't need right. everything tied up because that's what leads to this bigger world. Uh, that's really lived in that's really uh, something that feels uh, like a galaxy long ago and far far away that really was actually there on that note i i do really appreciate the the smaller scale of of the plots of these episodes because after after watching you know recent tv shows whatever they might be it's always you know bigger bigger and, you know, the world is going to end. And, and I mean, the universe is at stake. And I mean, and, <laughs> and those things are a lot of fun. I mean, you know, Marvel and DC do a really good job of that. But it's also nice to just have kind of a, a self-contained little story that actually doesn't relate a whole lot to, you know, that it relates to the bigger world. And we know that Baby Yoda is going to relate to the bigger world. And we don't know how, but these events are sort of you know, isolated or like the second episode where he just has to go get his parts back from the Jawas doesn't really mean a lot in the grand scheme of things, but it was a really cool, fun story to, to see play out. And so I appreciate the just the slower pace <laughs> lets me like breathe a little yeah. bit more and digest it. And <laughs> and and I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's 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 like those Marvel uh, Netflix shows like Jessica Jones and Daredevil Punisher. It's like we know these characters exist in like the big Marvel universe um, and they, they, you know, they'll reference, you know, the events of the Avengers movies here and there. But the stories are really just about them and, and, and their world and their their part of town, usually just a borough of New York. And uh, it doesn't really expand outside of that. Yeah, I, we, we've been talking about that same problem with some of the other shows we're watching, too, uh, the, the just the the creep of the the scope of the show like my my uh my daughter and my wife are watching Riverdale right now and the show started off fine you know like a kind of modern day archie comics kind of feel and now it's like gotten to the point where it like every single decision the characters make is about uh being in a gang or being in the mafia or like this huge like completely out of control <laughs> thing and we're like Holy cow, I mean the show was good. It could have just kept doing what it was doing and not it didn't need to get into all of this territory to be a good show. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see where where the Mandalorian goes with this, but I'm definitely excited for Friday. Cool. Well, that's it from us. Uh what did you think of episode 4 of The Mandalorian? Be sure to email or comment on our Facebook or Twitter page and let us know. You can email us at any feedback at starwars@sqpn.com. At and you can find StarQuest on Facebook at facebook.com slash StarQuestMedia and on Twitter at SQPN. We'd like to take a moment now to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Wars, including Cindy M., Daniel C., Sally H., Gregory F., and Darius M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Wars and all the shows that we make here at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Also, be sure to subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you listen to your podcasts, or also on the SQPN YouTube channel. To find previous episodes of The Secrets of Star Wars, please visit sqpn.com slash Star Wars. And we'll be back next week when we'll be, di when we'll be discussing the fifth episode of The Mandalorian. And until then, Andrew Hermes, thank you for joining me and sharing The Secrets of Star Wars. As always, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thomas Sanjurjo, thank you for joining us as well. It's been a pleasure. Angela Cialana, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Absolutely. And Mike Creevy, pleasure having you on board as well. May the force be with you guys. 
And with your spirit. With your spirit. <laughs> with your spirit. <laughs> Gets me every time. <laughs> and once again, I'm Father Andrew Kinstetter. Thank you for listening to the Secrets of Star Wars on StarQuest. <laughs>